So I'm curious here, out of this group, who has done a land deal? Like who has bought and sold land? Every time I come to one of these, it's like only a handful of people. You know, got like probably six or seven folks in here who have actually bought and sold a piece of land, which I think just goes to speak to this niche. Is like there's just a ton of opportunity. Every time you go to a real estate meetup, you're going to see most people talking about multifamily, single family, etc. Um, but I love land. I've been doing it now over six years, big into subdividing. That's what I want to talk to you guys about here today. So I'm probably going to stay out of presentation mode because for those of you who've been to my stuff before, you know, it's very interactive. So if you have questions or anything, just let me know. We'll be jumping back and forth, Google Earth, all sorts of stuff. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Jasniak, owner of Jazz Land and several other uh, entities. Most recently, I bought the small unincorporated town of Cornutas, Texas, which is way out west near El Paso. We got a cafe there, six spot RV park, six spot uh, motel, and some mobile homes. Um, not here to sell anything. I do have a course, I do have a mentor. For this event, I did land.com or land.johnjasnick.com forward slash course. There's a link down there. You put in promo code impact. My thousand dollar course is 97 bucks. Um, if y'all hit me up on top of that, I'll give you even more stuff for free, basically. So let's get into it. So why should you subdivide land as opposed to any other facet of real estate? This is the land price for Texas here over the last, well, since 1972. It's just gone through the roof. Most recently in 2018 and after that, because of COVID and everything, obviously, everyone's wanting to move away from the city. They want livestock, they want affordable housing. And a lot of people are moving to, Tex to Texas. There's a statistic here. Um, obviously land is decreasing in availability, but Texas has added nearly 4 million new residents from 2010 to 2020. And that's even before the pandemic, so I don't even know how much we've added since uh, after 2020. So the land prices have gone through the roof uh, in Texas. We obviously have folks moving here in California, New York. Texas is a great place to be. It's a great place for land. Move this thing out of the way to start, Jerry. Alright. So where where, where do we subdivide? Like I get asked this question all the time. Um, you know, we're subdividing, but where do you do it? And I forgot to go live on IG, but we're live now. Okay, so this is a city limit map of all of Texas. It's a little bit hard to see, but obviously DFW, Houston, and San Antonio, major metropolises, right? I do a lot of stuff in West and Central Texas. So Abilene, Midland, Odessa, Lubbock, even smaller places down here like Fort Stockton. A good rule of thumb, 10,000 residents or more in that city. Fort Stockton's got like 10,000. We got a project going on out there that's selling selling well. Anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes outside of a major city. DFW, you can get, um, someone mentioned Corsicana. If you get out in Corsicana, Navarro County, Hill County, you're talking 30, 60 minutes outside of the metropolis. And people out there, um, you know, 30, 40 grand an acre at least, and it sells like hotcakes. So we want to stay close to city, uh, to cities, but that's not to say you can't do um, recreational subdivides. You know, there's plenty of stuff like way out west here in Hudspeth County or out in the desert. You can still buy land for, gosh, less than three, four hundred per acre. You can get land for two, three hundred per acre, subdivide it, and sell it for five hundred to a thousand per acre. So it's all just an arbitrage on the price, right? And as we subdivide, we're adding even more value. And props to you, Brian, because um, three grand, like anyone who's like, how can I get started? How much does it take? The dude did a deal, made over 50 Gs with three grand. So that's pretty impressive. So 10, you, can get, you can get it done with less than 10K. Obviously, the less money you have to invest, the more they work, more sweat equity that you need to put in up front. I wanna talk about this misconception because a lot of people, when I talk subdividing land, immediately it comes into their head, 
that I'm working with developers or like DR Horton or some sort of mobile home company, stuff like that. The biggest play here is skipping the developer and just selling straight to Sally or Joe Schmo who's trying to get away from the city. No restrictions, they can have livestock, they can have affordable housing, they can have affordable land. To me, that's the new American dream is people move outside the city um, and own their piece of land, right? The cities are getting crowded. We all know it. Uh, there's craziness going on in the cities, politics, um, economics, etc. If you can get outside the city limits and create a subdivision and provide people cheap, affordable land, uh, you can make millions. Now, the most important factors that we need to keep in mind, obviously, price is at top. I talked about it. You can do rural subdivisions in the middle of nowhere, the desert. Buy it for two, three hundred per acre, and sell it for eight hundred to a thousand per acre, right? So price is at the top, no matter what. If I get a good deal on a piece of land, and I know I can make money, then I'm gonna buy it. Doesn't matter where it's at. It could be the desert, it could be in the middle of the city in Dallas. Kind of underneath price, I break it out. Access, water, and power, in that order. It's the first thing you're gonna see when you go to sell a piece of land that someone's gonna say, how do I get to it? They're gonna want an address, a GPS coordinate, a pin drop, etc. I've sold landlocked land. Um, I've sold land in the middle of nowhere. You can't sell it. Again, if I bought it at $50 per acre, and I can sell a piece of landlocked land for $200 per acre, I'll do it. But the first thing someone's gonna want to know is how they get to their land. So access, number one. Water's number two. Uh, in Texas, a lot of water is um, by well. So obviously we're in Texas. I'm gonna, I do most of my stuff in Texas, so this presentation probably be tailored most towards Texas, but this applies everywhere. Um, you can do it everywhere. I got students doing it in Virginia, Michigan, Florida, uh, Colorado, all over the place. But water, number two. Either a water line um, or a water well. Now again, that's not to say that you can't sell dry land. I, I've sold plenty of dry land. However, counties are making it a little bit more difficult nowadays uh, to, uh, to sell dry land because they'll require a water feasibility study or some sort of report from a local municipality um, that shows that there's water available. Actually, let's go. For those of you who don't know uh, this resource, there's a great resource in Texas. If you just search Puck Map, <coughs> For those of you who haven't seen um, this one, this map is shows all the water lines in Texas. You just click their little map viewer, um, and you can drill into here and get all of your water municipalities in Texas. And all I do, so when I'm looking at a piece out near Corsicana or whatever, I come in here, boom, immediately go to the GIS map here. I, Zoom in to wherever we're, you know, Navarro County, South Dallas. You just click here, um, if it loads up, and boom, it pulls up. Uh, this is utility, Buena Vista Bethel SUD. So I'll just go to Google, search that, pull up their contact info, and now you're in a game of, okay, talking to their engineers or whoever. I'm looking at a project on such and such road. Um, what sort of water line capacity do you have? Another good uh, resource is if you just Google Texas water well map, It'll pull up a beautiful map view where you can pull all the water well reports uh, in Texas to see if you can get well water in the area. So that's your two water resources. Power, that's just talking to local municipalities, um, making calls to the county. Uh, the county will know, you can find a meter nearby and see who the power entity is. A good estimate I see is probably $3 to $10 uh, per foot to run power, it really just depends. Uh, some of these uh, co-ops or uh, major providers will actually run it for free. Like I did one in Midland County, Texas with Encore. They ran it to my subdivision. Uh, it was over two miles of power and they, they did it for free. So they're getting a bunch of customers out of it. Just gotta talk to them. Now, the county regulations, this is where people get tripped up because they think they get uh, some statewide exemption or they can just go out and create a little road and. <clears throat> create a subdivision. Well, it's not that easy because the counties actually have PDFs for subdivisions, wherever you're subdivided. Let's pull one of these suckers up. It's supposed to be working. Press control. Here we go. All right, so this is Liberty County, Texas. This is down there in Houston. I actually love this place because 
there's a few places out there where they created old subdivisions that are acre sub acre lots and all the people from Houston buy it and they sell like hotcakes. Now the problem is if you wanted to create a subdivision out there today, you're dealing with a 242 page PDF of regulations on how you need to pave roads, you need to do compression testing, um, you need to have water feasibility and floodplain surveys and engineers and the whole nine yards and it, it's just really hard for someone like me or you to go out there and do a subdivision. You know, D.R. Horton, all those guys, sure, they got millions of dollars, but for us and my keep it simple mentality, when I see something like this, uh, I start to cringe. Now, this one, this is Jones County, Texas, out near Abilene. We got a project going on there right now. 28 page PDF. And it's not quite the Wild West out there still, but they allow gravel roads, um, you know, very loosely regulated, no water feasibility needed. Uh, if you get, keep it 10 plus acres uh, with access to all lots, your plat exempt. Uh, it's just, you know, seamless planning approval process, basically 30 to 60 days. You get in front of the commissioner's court, in and out, they approve you, and you start selling lots. And what I do is I actually start selling the lots uh, before it's technically approved. We start pre-selling them. So obviously a huge difference, 28 pages versus 240 pages. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Now, really when you talk about subdividing, it kind of gets broken down into two different types of subdivides. There's a little bit of gray area, but we're talking either a major or a minor subdivide. A major subdivide, we're talking full on plat approval, probably sub 10 acre lots, you're having to build a road, um, etc. A lot of stuff for beginners, and what I always recommend is to start over here with a minor subdivision. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but right here along the top is a county road and I just went in and created three separate tracks that all front the road. They're each 12 acres. Uh, that's Ector County, Texas, so you're plat exempt if you're above 10 acre lots. And so basically all I needed to do, literally, I get this under contract, uh, call it a 60 day close. During that closing time, I run a surveyor out there. Uh, he does the survey. I have him, I, I send him a Google Earth screenshot and I say, hey Peter, uh, this is how I want you to carve up these lots, we'll go to Google Earth right now, and uh, he sends me back a flat map for each lot. I buy the land, and before I even technically buy it, I'm already marketing, you know, here's track one, track two, track three, and hopefully we get some pre-sales before we even close it, because when I go to close it, I don't have to do any kind of approvals. That flat map literally just gets slapped on the back of their deed, and I record it at the county clerk's office. So. You know, something like that, not uncommon to buy for 5,000 an acre, and you create five or 10 acre tracks uh, with public road access, and you sell it for, you know, you buy it for five, sell it for nine, 10, 12,000 uh, per acre. So those ones are really easy. It's not as scalable as the major subdivides, but it's a great start uh, place to start as a beginner. You could easily do multi six figure deals just with minor subdivides there. Has anyone ever, has anyone ever done a subdivision out here? Dang, nobody, okay. If y'all have any questions too, I'm gonna do this stuff, please stop me. Uh, so this is like, I think what I'm most known for. Um, this is my Jazz Acres subdivide, bought it for 1.5 million, uh, gave them $250,000 down and 1.25 million over 10 years seller financing, which we'll talk about here in a second. And I created 74 different lots. This is your major subdivision. We had to go through a uh, floodplain, build a road, um, get signed off from the power company, go through the county uh, commissioner's court, they approve it. Um, it was a purchase for 1.5 and all said and done, it's not really the purpose science, but it was a $5 million uh, dollar project. I still have, I think, about $2 million in notes receivable on this thing. I'm a bigger owner financing guy, so I create a lot of notes, I originate my own notes, and I collect cash flow on those notes. And I'll sell notes, which is why some of this is it's not five million anymore. So I sold some for cash and sold some of those notes to investors to go do other projects. It was kind of cool. Some guy built, this is what I'm talking about. He built a dirt bike track out here. And it's not in this photo, but there's a barn dominium out there too that he built. Um, so stuff like that, people just eat up, right? We're creating that for them. There's a huge market for that. Uh, you're not gonna get that inside of the city, you know, in Dallas, Texas. This is that Jones County project, which will, it's kind of the gray area between major and minor subdivides, bless you. Um, 
But here's five acre lots, there's 140 acre piece, it's got great road access, so obviously this sets up perfectly for a minor subdivision. The better access, um, usually the less work you're gonna have to do. And so what a lot of counties will allow you to do as well, if you see these blue strips right here, these are flagpole strips. And so we utilize that, it's a 30 foot strip that comes off of that back lot and touches the road. And a lot of counties will let you do that and that'll get you through that plat uh, exemption. So that way, you know, it has public road frontage and it has access and it's above 10 acres, so it'll be plat exempt. Um, it's a good, a lot of counties allow that. It's a good way to get around a bunch of loopholes, basically. Get through a bunch of loopholes. So I get asked all the time, how do I find my deals? Several of you were asking that before I even started. Right now, it's actually probably 70, 30, 70% on the MLS and probably 20 to 30% on uh, direct mail. This is my offer letter that I use right here. I put my photo on it. I like that. Um, I've seen to have, there's been great feedback on me and students and stuff putting photos on their um, offer letter. And what we do now pretty much exclusively is we will mail um, a seller financed offer letter. So I'll offer the landowner 10 to 20% down and ask them to carry the rest on the note for five to 10 years, it depends. And what I found is if they're not interested in doing that, boom, I revert to a cash offer. If I really like the deal, I can offer them cash and I can go find a private lender or sell some notes to raise the money and give them the cash. Or uh, another good uh, item in your back pocket is to have a balloon in your back pocket. So if they're like, well, we don't want to be, wait 10 years to be paid out. Well, like, okay, Mr. Seller, uh, let's do a one or two year balloon. So I'll give them, call it 10% down, pay them out for 12 to 24 months, and then boom, their whole note uh, comes due. So that's a great alternative. Better than giving straight cash from an economic perspective. Now, I actually want to talk about this one. I think someone in the crowd should do this one um, tonight. I've, I've been looking at this one. I don't even think Brian knows about this one. So this is Polk County, Texas, uh, down near Liberty County, um, where I just talked about. It's the county to the north or northeast. And they make subdividing very hard. Polk County, that 240 page PDF uh, showed, Polk County is very similar. Uh, what's nice about this though, is the, the seven acres that's actually for sale is this little strip right here. And there's a road that you know just goes along the whole thing. Um, I actually have it in here. We don't need to go. This is good enough. So, uh, basically, what you could, what you could do, obviously, is just um, flat this uh, sucker along this road and just create seven one-acre lots. Uh, some of you guys are asking me, well, how much do I? How do I know how much land is going for? And doing like comparable analysis and stuff. So if we just, you know, this is Polk County. They're offering. For eleven thousand per acre, I obviously wouldn't offer eleven thousand. I'd probably offer eight to ten thousand per acre. And you go to uh, Polk County, if this thing ever wants to load up, and to search one acre lots. I already know what they go for because that's home of the big thicket estates, which that's one of those subdivides that are. Uh, old subdivides where they got around the plat restrictions back in the day, but if we just set our filters from like one to three acre lots, let's see what comes up. So let's go to sort, price low to high, two acres for 32.5, one acre for 25, 2.8 for 45, two for 50. I mean, in that location, I'm pretty confident uh, you can get that for, you can sell one acre on that $77,000 listing for 20,000. You know, if you own or finance it off, probably 25 to 30,000 if you held a note. So you're talking about turning a piece of land, $10,000 an acre, you're gonna run a surveyor out there real quick, say, this is how I want to broke it up. It's gonna be the easiest Google Earth breakout of your life. So it's gonna be just seven polygons right next to one another. Uh, you'll probably have to go through the commissioner's court because it's less um, than five acres, but it has public access. It's all right there on the road. I know the power lines are there. They're gonna 
I don't know why they wouldn't approve that. You know, it's gonna have to go through the process where it'll be 30 to 60 days, it'll be approved, and boom, you'll be selling uh, one acre lots now. Why don't I want to do that deal? Because it's kind of, it's kind of a smaller deal for me now. That's more of like, I'd rather not. I'd rather focus my energy elsewhere. But one of you guys should definitely make some calls and do that deal. So you're looking at like a $70,000 profit? Yeah, probably a seventy dollars to $100,000 profit. Now, even better, if you can find a private lender who will give you, like Brad over here, at least 50% LTV, and now your Brad funds deals, by the way, shout out to Brad, they grow off you guys who are looking to do land deals. Um, but, you know, you leverage your money, get someone like him, 50 to 80% LTV, now your cash on cash isn't double, it's probably quadruple. Just a question, what do you think the turnaround on that would be? One to two years? Very quick, one to two years. No, uh, great question. Less than six months. Yeah, um, it's a great question. That's another huge misconception I should have covered from the start. That Jazz Acres development I did, that was 74 lots. We had that all sold in five or six months. It was technically less than six months. And I'll talk about how I sell these here in a second, but a lot of these projects, because you're offering such affordable land to a huge buyer pool that are trying to move outside of the city limits, you're talking you know, four to six months, I would say, on average for these, to sell, to sell the entire thing. A lot of them will move a lot quicker. You can get your money out of the deal probably a lot quicker than six months. So someone in here, uh, just remember that. Look look this up tomorrow and make some calls. Let's blow this. Uh, Karen Stout, blow Karen up tomorrow. Okay, so how do I fund uh, my deal? So four, four ways. Straight cash, obviously, which I don't like because <laughs> economics are bad. Uh, bank financing, which I've actually never done. Um, I got a line of credit once, but I've never had bank financing on a piece of land collateralized. Three and four is what I operate most exclusively on, basically, is private money and seller financing. Um, any ideas why we don't want to use bank funding for land? 20% down. Down. down, too much red tape. I like that, that's for sure. Yeah, too much red tape. I like uh, I like to own finance off a lot of my lots. So uh, if I had a, a loan from the bank, they're going to want first lien, which is understandable, obviously. And when I go to do a wraparound note, it's called sell to my end buyer um, for financing. They start paying me monthly. A lot of banks do not like that. Um, that's why I like private people, private money, or the seller, because you can literally take. Uh, the documents, which right here I have. On the buy side, I just craft my deed of trust in a way that removes the due on sale clause that a traditional bank would have in their uh, documents. By the way, banks, even if they did let you do wraparounds, um, every transaction they're gonna want to go through a title company, they don't want to have their attorneys look over the documents, they're gonna charge you a fee every uh, transaction. I do a lot of self-closing. Um, and I operate on a very quick time frame. So even if we go through a title company, I want it 30 days or less. So there's, I don't need to be dealing with banks, attorneys, and sending them documents, they're on vacation, they're not replying, they don't like email, whatever. So this is a lot cleaner. Um, and basically what this is, there's three clauses. The first and most important one is the property or any portion may be sold while I'm paying the seller. That's obvious, we're gonna go and subdivide it. We're gonna sell off part of the property or the whole thing. Um, the second one, which same thing as the bank, the seller is going to want uh, their lien to be the first lien. That's you know I always say, Mr. Seller, of course your lien is going to be first. If I stop paying you, you're going to take back the land. Uh, and the third and maybe the most important one, honestly, is that you the lender agrees to partial releases if you sell part of the land. So if I'm buying those seven acres and I have it on seller financing, and I go to sell off one of those acres, someone here says, hey John, that's a great piece of land, I'm gonna give you 20,000 for one acre. Okay, well, I'm paying the lender, and now I have to give that person a deed to give it to them free and clear so they can do whatever with. Well, the lender still has their lien on the whole thing, so we need to get that one acre released from the lender so that we can deliver it to the end buyer free and clear so that they can go uh, do whatever they want with it. By the way, use, this is if you're using private money too, you're on a deed of trust or an agreement with a private lender, you're gonna want this as well. Okay, so the buy side contract, obviously super important. 
we want to be as transparent with folks up front. So this Polk County one, um, if you have a private money person or you ask the seller seller financing, I would go in and to the negotiation deck, hey, I want to subdivide this land into one acre lots. Because you're gonna want in your contract something that says, okay, we're gonna use this creative deed of trust. Um, another clause that I always like is seller's sole and exclusive remedy to a buyer default of contract is to claim the earnest money and option money as damages. That's just a sneaky way of saying, uh, you can't sue me for performance. Um, should you be deep in investigating that seven acre lot, you find out the county wants you to have a water line and there's no water line out there, you can get out of the deal without the seller suing you to buy the deal, which you can do uh, in Texas, by the way, especially under the TREC contract. It's always good to have that in there and just be forthright up front. So how the, the private money stuff, like get asked all the time, like how do you find someone like Brad? How do you find um, the private money guys? What's the name of that website? Uh, FundMyLand. FundMyLand.com, that's a good one. Um, it's not in this presentation, but y'all gonna want to write that down. But um, if you just go to Facebook and go to groups, you're gonna want to get in all of these land groups. There's a few good ones. Land Flipping 101, Only Land Fans, Kendall Lejeune's kind of built this one up. Yeah, I was on his podcast a couple weeks ago. That's a fun time. Um, land Flipping Arbitrage, that's my group. Um, the, Geek, the, land Acad or the, the Land Geek group has a good one. Search Land Geek, uh, they have a good group. So there's probably seven to 10 groups. You don't wanna get all the groups. They have five to 10, 15,000 members in them. And where was it? I just saw it right here. The official, we'll go to this one, the official Land Geek group. Someone's hit me up on the listing right now. Okay, so we're in this group. Uh, he's got, let's see how many members he has. He's got 11,200 members. This is one of the OGs of the land community. This is, this is kind of who I learned from. This is the first guy I heard talk about land in 2016. Uh, Side Hustle Show episode 108 with Nick Loper. Mark Podolsky goes on there, starts talking about land just like how I am to you guys right now. It was more about flipping though, and so I bought his course, uh, and here we are today, I guess. <laughs> so you go to this group and search this group, uh, deal funding. Okay, funding in the last seven months, blah, blah, blah. Does anyone have interest in funding? All right, well, there's 21 comments. I guarantee you, you'll find right here, Eric, I actually work with Eric. Uh, that's what I just used as a private money guy on the Jones County deal that I talked to you. He gave me uh, 200,000 at 18% over five years. I'd be interested in either buying some land notes or doing some deal funding. All right, well, that's one guy. And so all you do is you just go down the list and um, find funders like Brad or Eric in the groups. And it becomes really easy once you have the deal, like you get that Polk County one under contract for 70 G's, like, hey, Eric, uh, I have this deal under contract, it's 70 G's, you know, I don't already got the money, but I think it's worth 150 after we subdivide it. Okay, cool, he comes in, he funds it. Um, Y'all can split profits 50-50, that's pretty common. Um, and, and here's my recommendation, okay? Like I just took on 200,000 in debt um, from him, but that's because my notes are receivable uh, receivables are in the millions. When you're starting off, don't take on debt if you can afford not to. Go to people like Brad, go to people like Eric, and ask them just to fund the deal and split profits. That way, if something goes wrong, you're not on the hook for $200,000 uh, in debt. Instead, just pay back the investor uh, first, which is pretty common, and then work a profit split after that, right? So that way, you know, you're basically working for the investor, but as a beginner, you know, I, I always laugh when the beginners are like, oh, I want to split profits 70, 30, or 80, 20. I'm like, dude, you should be giving the investor 70 or 60%. Like, just get your foot in the door. So do that when you're starting off. Uh, there's plenty of people out there looking to fund deals. Anyone else fund deals in here? A couple people. Look for those hands. Um, so this is my ammo chart on my huge seller financing deal for 1.25 million. It's kind of hard to see, um, but what I really want to emphasize here, whether you're working with a private money guy or the seller, this is actually my favorite app 
right here. Y'all should download this. I play with this. Uh, I'm on this thing every single day on my phone. The way you're gonna find it, if you just search loan calculator, remember this dude's name up there. I can't, I can't say that. Uh, yeah, Win the Knock. This guy, just remember this name. The reason why I like this loan calculator is because it allows you to, you can kind of see it here, it allows you to lock any different variable you want. So if I want to know uh, how my loan gets affected when I bump it to five, 10 years instead of five, it auto, it's just goal seeking and automatically calculating uh, in the background. So if you get to know your numbers and just you're playing around with this calculator, so you know immediately you see the Polk County deal, okay, this is 77,000, Eric's gonna give me 80%, so he's gonna give me 63,000, okay, 18%, how much will I be paying him monthly? Boom, in the loan calculator. I think I can get one acre lots and I can sell each one acre lot for 500 per month. Okay, how much of a note is that? And so you just run these numbers and you'll be surprised even if the Polk County deal doesn't pan out, even if Karen's like, oh, sorry, the one's already sold or there's some crazy thing going wrong with it. You've, you've done like a comparable study on a subdivide. And so that repetition um, of the case study time and time again, next time you see a deal like that, boom, it's automatically gonna pop in your head, okay, this is how I break it out, this is how I run the funding, this is how my numbers work, this is gonna be my IRR, um, which, you know, this whole game, this whole game is driven by IRR, otherwise known as yield. Um, you're gonna hear, as you get more into this, investors and people, that's all they care about, how much annualized rate of return, your IRR is just your annualized rate of return, taking into account time value of money. So just imagine like this box and I'm just plowing capital into this box and the more return I can get out of this as quick as possible, obviously I'm gonna become wealthier. So in an ideal world, we have infinite IRR. We don't have to give any of our money and boom, just money's created out of thin air. But you know, the higher we can drive that number so the quicker we can get back our capital and uh, the better terms we can get on the deal, the more money we're gonna make. That's not the same thing as return on investment, right? ROI, I can say over 10 years, I had an ROI of 200%. Well, I tripled my money. If I did the IRR calculation on that, how quickly did I get that back over 10 years? It's not gonna be a 200% return. You know, it might be 10%, might be 20%, depends. So this is my favorite calculator. This is how I analyze all my deals. Uh, let's see if we can pull it up. <clears throat> Used to be it used to be financial calculators. It's now accurate calculators, uh, and they have the best IRR calculator. I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about this a million times. Or you who know me, but the reason why this is important is because okay, you input your initial investment, it allows a month by month breakdown of your returns, and you can put in negative numbers too. So if you're paying some under uh, three thousand a month on the debt for a property. You can input your negative three thousand every month, and you can input your six thousand per month or whatever it is. And kind of my golden rule is um, I need at least a double in my notes receivable on my on my uh, debt. So let's say in this Jones County deal, uh, I get fifty thousand down, two hundred thousand dollar note from Eric. I need to be able to create at least four hundred thousand in notes receivable from that subdivide project. That's bare minimum, but my, I like to keep my debt to uh, notes receivable number at like 33%, so that really is, is higher. It's like I'm, I need to get at least triple on my debt. But all of this, and, and the golden number is your IRR right here, you want to be over 100% on every subdivide. So when you're analyzing this Polk County deal uh, tomorrow and you're buying it for 77,000, you know, you're gonna wanna put in negative 77,000, and I mean, how much, what's the fair? Let's say we get seven one acre lots, each doing 500 a month for 30 months. So we'll make it real easy. That's 3,500 per month. Starting immediately, you know, it's not, it's gonna take a little bit to sell, but that cheap, it's gonna, it's gonna sell. We'll get some money down. Let's just say we do 500 down and 500 a month for 60 months. So we got 61 months of 3,500 coming in. Uh, would y'all do this deal? 66.7% IRR. It's not 100, but it's better than the stock market. 
And if you can get, if you can only give 20% down, because you work with a private money guy, I don't, I don't even know what that number would be. It would be way higher. It would probably be multiple hundreds of percent um, IRR. So that's kind of what I'm looking at on every deal. It's the exact calculator I use. Any questions on that? All right. So kind of as a whole, evaluating uh, subdivisions, just what I talked about, IRR and economics are critical. It's the most important part. What can I get it for and what can I sell it for? Um, I either find them online or I offer or direct mail. We're aiming kind of 70 to 80 cents on the dollar on the entire piece as a whole. Um, never overpay for a piece of land because you think it's gonna be some amazing subdivide project. I kind of get in the same mindset myself. I get FOMO. And there's really not going to be another deal like, oh, really need this one. Um, always, you know, 70 to 80 percent as is. And then when you subdivide it down, it's probably going to be 20 to 30 cents on the dollar for the entire piece. It's kind of the golden golden rule. Uh, every county is different. We already talked about that, right? Um, the Jones County, 24 page or whatever, versus the Liberty County, 250 page. It's freaking crazy. Uh, access is most important. Then we got water and power. And then, um, you know, little to no improvements. I, I, I didn't even mention that. A lot of this stuff, uh, all I do at most is I build a road. I go in, basically all I'm doing is just creating a flat map, lowering the acreage, and then delivering that uh, to my customers. At worst case, we're gonna have to do some engineering, maybe a drainage study, maybe a couple of test wells, or build a road. Um, I don't drill wells for customers. I don't put in septics for customers. Uh, I don't do any of that. The reason why, because when you start doing that, let's say you need to put in a $10,000 well and a $10,000 septic for a customer. Okay, you just put in 20 Gs. Back to the IRR calculation. How much do you need to get out of that 20,000 that you invested up front to generate, we're generating 100% IRR on the subdivide. Well, that's not gonna happen. You're not gonna be able to upcharge someone another 20,000, so it's not like you added 40,000 of value for the 20,000 improvements. And the customers just don't perceive it that way. Let them drill and put in their own septic and do their own improvements because you're just, you're not going to be able to finance it off to them at a rate that's worth inputting that capital up front. I'd rather use all that extra capital on another piece of land. Okay, so you guys are probably thinking like, okay, that's great. This Polk County stuff, uh, is Polk, what the heck is Polk County and how do I know it's going to sell? Well, first thing we look at is comps. Uh, which I showed you already, the stuff that's listed online, going for twenty to 30000 per acre. Now, just because it's listed for that doesn't mean it's actually selling for that. What it's listed for and what it's selling for, two separate things, right? So how do we kind of tease that out and figure out, okay, it's listed for this, but is there actually interest at 20000 per acre? I like to call it the Facebook uh, demand test. And basically, all I do, and this is it's a little hard to see, but this is what I did in, uh, on that Jones County deal near Abilene, is I create a Facebook ad. I do a lot of uh, marketing on Facebook. I'll do it either on the marketplace, well, usually on the marketplace. Um, so I'll come into the marketplace, I'll create a little ad, which I have one up right now, which I'll show you all. So I'll post this to all, I'll join the local buy and sell groups. So you'll search probably Houston, Texas for Polk County, go to the local buy and sell groups. You'll post it to there. And then um, you'll also post it to the marketplace and you can boost and run ads to your marketplace listing. And so that's what I'll do. I'll do this little ad. This is what we got for sale right now. I, I just posted it two days ago. It's out near Pecos, Texas, thousand down, thousand a month for 48 months for 15 acres. I think I paid like four grand for this lot. Uh, several years ago, and I only held on to it because of pipelines and stuff like that. I was getting paid right away. But anyways, I'll create an ad like this. So if you would create an ad, Polk County, I would put coming soon. One acre, Polk County, thousand down, 500 a month for 36 months or 60 months, 500 a month for 60 months coming soon. And I would do a whole description on the property and I would run at least a hundred dollars in ads to it. And I would see what it says. Less than $10 per message is pretty good. Like if you get under $5 per message, it's smoking. Like if you're hitting like, if you, if you do some stuff like out in your Corsicana, like your lots you were talking about back there, you post that on Facebook for 30, 40,000 per acre, you'll probably be at two or $3 uh, per lead. 
something like a smaller market like Abilene or something, 662 is what it came in at. And I actually, I paid a lot on that. I paid 2,200 bucks. I was actually building a pre-sale list. But you know, what you really want to do is run 100 or $200 of ads. So less than $10 in Abilene, very good. Polk County, I'd, lo I'd like to see less than 10. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it got less than five because Houston is so close and I know the way the market is out there. So if people start messaging you, when can I see it? Where is this at? Can I buy it? Like, you know, what's going on? Then you know people are gonna wanna buy it. And there's been times where like me or a student has been like, dude, I'm getting freaking hit up and like, I've only spent $100 or $70, I'm gonna turn it off because I already got like 30 messages. Like obviously people are gonna buy it. I just don't have it to sell it yet. Um, so for, is anyone in here an e -com? You know, like, you ever see the e-com uh, businesses or companies? Like, they'll just run a Facebook ad, like, you know, this toothbrush or gadget or whatever for, you see them on Instagram ads all the time, you click it, it's like, these things are not even real, and it's like, they're testing the market before they go to China and get a million pieces of a product. They want to see if people are gonna buy it, and so that's, like, man, why don't we just do this with land? So that's kind of what I coined the Facebook demand test to do that on Facebook. Uh, it's worked uh, very well. So, and you can pre-sell the land with this as you get, you know, closer to actually closing. Just be like, hey, I, you know, we're closing. You want to give me money as a down payment to secure it? So, less than ten dollars. That's what I talk about. Um, it's okay. Like ten, less than ten is good. Uh, less than five is pretty smoking. Uh, ten to twenty, if the deal is good enough, like I would still do it. Over twenty, over thirty, it's like, eh, probably not so great. And this is gonna change because Facebook ads are gonna go up, obviously with inflation and market conditions. Um, I don't see a situation where we go down, so it's gonna keep increasing. So, this is kind of what, I, what a lot of people struggle with. I would say is, okay, well, every subdivide is different, obviously, because a piece of land could be a crazy shape or it could be very straightforward, like the Polk County deal one is kind of straightforward. Uh, it's just a long piece of land. We know exactly how we're gonna break it up. Um, this is an easy square. This is one that we just got under contract in Midland County for 1.1 million. It's 150 acres with a 3,200 square foot custom built home. And so what you're seeing is my brainstorm of how I want this to play out. I use Google Earth for all this. It's drawing polygons using measuring tool on Google Earth. And I'm thinking in my head the entire time back to the loan calculator, okay, these are all two acre lots. We got 65 of them. And the one big lot with the house in the middle, how much is each 65, how much is each two acre lot gonna sell for? Okay, uh, about 20 grand per acre, so it's gonna be 40 Gs, plus the house, adding it all up in my head. How much debt am I gonna be paying on the 1.1? And then it just comes, it becomes a numbers game with the IRR calculator. And um, I actually got a pretty good deal with my business partner, Mike, on this um, to fund it. And uh, we're splitting profits 50-50. I am giving some money, uh, but we're splitting profits 50-50. I'm running the whole thing, subdividing it, um, the whole nine yards. So you're gonna get to a point where you do a few of these and people are gonna be like, hey, this guy's onto something or this girl's onto something. We want to give you money to do these deals. Um, and they'll participate with you. So I get asked all the time to partner with JV. I'll do that all day long, but I'm not gonna give up any of my capital because I'm out doing my own deals, which you guys should be doing as well. You should be raising capital, doing your own deals, asking people for money um, to fund deals, and then subdividing it. And you know, these are two acre lots. Could I go down to one acre lots? Um, probably, but then the, the architecture is gonna change because you don't want your lots to be too long and narrow. Right, kind of. The, there's 43,560 square feet in an acre. So when you start looking at a one-acre piece, you're talking about 125 by 325, 125 by 350. Doing the math off the top of my head, or 150 by 300. And you know, you start getting down under 100 feet wide, and now you can't build stuff in there. And most counties have. 100 foot uh, lot frontages anyway. So that's kind of all playing in my mind with the county regs. I'm like, okay, we need to actually make lots feasible for people to build on and do stuff with. You can't just start jamming in a bunch of one acre lots. And if I did, okay, now the lots are probably gonna become too long and narrow. So what I'm actually gonna have to do is probably build more roads in there. Well, now it becomes a whole another economic analysis. Okay, I'm paying $30 per linear foot for a Caliche road. 
probably $25 because the pit is right there. So $25 per foot, this is a half mile, half mile. So if we needed to do another mile of road, that's you know probably another 125 G's. Is it worth it to make one acre lots instead of two acre lots? I'm getting 20,000 per acre for two acre lots. Am I gonna get 25, 30 for one acre lots? All that's running in the back of my mind. And I mean, this there's not gonna be enough spread on this one to bring it down even lower. Is it? Two acre lot's gonna sell for it the same as a one acre lot. I mean, you can get it down to like 0 0.1, 0 0.25, like the deal that Sherry sent, sent me. Like, yes, like bring it down to like 0.1 acres because now you're but now you're talking about running sewer, running uh, water lines out there, which it's never gonna happen out here because we're outside of city limits. There's no water line. Um, you have to be over one acre in Texas to drill your own well and get a septic. So as far as I know, so you're not gonna be able to do that out here. This was an, another project, one acre lots, road right down the middle, had some flood zone, lots with flood zones, you're gonna have to carve out differently. <laughs> this one, don't take my advice here, you're gonna wanna have a buildable space on each lot usually outside of the flood zone. On this one, I didn't even have that, but they still sold that, which is crazy. For you guys who are like, oh, can you sell a lot entirely in the flood zone? Well, I just did out here, these two lots and really three that had the flood zone sold for it was about the same price. I think I maybe discounted them a little bit, but they went off at pretty much the same same price. Pretty crazy. Another one we're doing in Fort Stockton, we're still selling this one. It's moving a little slow, because Fort Stockton, I don't know if you know where that, that's at, it's only like 10,000 people. Kind of in the middle of nowhere, West Texas, we're like a third sold on 20 lots in four months. So this is my slowest moving project I've ever done, actually. But we had to carve it up this way because Brown, uh, Fort Stockton has a groundwater conservation district where uh, you have to be above 10 acres to get uh, exempted to drill your own well. So I call up the city, they're like, we don't got a water line uh, capacity out here. Okay, well obviously my customers are gonna need wells. Well, I'd love to go down to one to five acre lots here, but you can't drill a well if you're at a five acre lot, you need to be above 10 acres. So, there can be a million different variables like that that can affect how you break these out. But as a general rule, you should obviously bring your acreages down as small as possible. So the slower you can bring it, the more people can afford it, the more you can uh, charge per acre. <coughs> Any questions on that stuff? Breaking out these lots, every project's different, obviously. So, and by the way, I'll, I'll give out my email at the end for those of y'all who, any land, like I just like looking at deals. Like I do it for free, just email me. If you have a deal, um, you want me to help you with the deal, look at a deal, etc. I, I answer all that stuff, so. So when you're breaking this lot, like you pay the survey individually for all of them, you can have survey already ready for each? Yeah, so what I usually do, it's a good question. So the question is, do I have a survey for each? And basically, what, what am I having the surveyor do? So I have, I will tell him or her basically how I want to break this thing out. Now I will listen to feedback from them, like hey, maybe do this, do that, but basically all I'm doing is messing around on Google Earth, sending them a screenshot, this is how I want it laid out. They'll go out and do it. I request uh, a plat index, which is, is this, just showing all the lots. And then I will request a plat for each individual lot, that way the buyers can have them. Now that's not always necessary, you can actually get away with um, a lot of times just the plat index, especially if the, there's clear call marks and stuff, and just record that on the back of their their lots. I just honestly I don't find that ethical. I think each individual buyer should get a plat map with their meets and bounds description. It's only going to cost you another hundred or two hundred bucks. They can go out, they can see their stakes, they have their distances, all that stuff. So plat index, uh, plat map for each individual lot with the meets and bounds description and then have them stake off every lot on the ground and right on the stakes, lot one, lot two, lot three. You'll be surprised how many surveyors do not write anything on the stakes, just put the stake in the ground, and then my buyers go out there, they're like, oh, I can't find lot one. It's like, well, for, for us, we're looking at this flat map, we're like, come on, dude, lot one's right here, it's like the road bends, look on your Google Earth, et cetera, but you're dealing with someone who, you know, they don't know this stuff, and they're out there on the ground. They're like, okay, I'm trying to read this plat map. What's going on? So have the have the lots labeled on the stakes. It's my recommendation. Now, I'm going to talk about this briefly. Working with uh, investors, 
one of the main ways that I like to raise money, and it's not talked about enough, in my opinion, is selling uh, notes. That's a whole business in and of itself. If y'all are like, man, this subdivide stuff is uh, way too complicated, this land stuff is way too complicated, go buy some notes from somebody, some great performing land notes, or home, or house notes, RV notes, you can do a bunch of, bunch of different uh, asset classes. Um, third, it depends on the, uh, the asset and uh, multiple different variables, variables, but usually 13 to 30% yield you can get on your money. So you'll get, annual, uh, you'll get monthly payments at annualized rate of return at uh, 13 to 30%. Right now, now, it depends on the piece of land. So right now, when I sell a land note to somebody, uh, you know, for my Jones County near Abilene or a project near Midland, that's like, okay, people are building on this. It's a big time subdivision. You're looking at probably a 15 to 18% um, annualized rate of return to the investor. Now, back to that loan calculator app, I'm plugging in, okay, I have this much left on my loan, this monthly payment, the investor wants 15%, and it will spit you out the principal, the amount that they will pay you today for that note. So people like to think of this in terms of principal discount, like, oh, they'll give you 75 cents on the dollar for your note. That is true, but how do you get to the 75 cents? Well, it depends on the note length, and your monthly payments, and um, the borrower might, or the note investor might be wanting a credit report or something on your buyers to evaluate risk. They may take into account that it's in the middle of nowhere. If it's in the middle of nowhere, uh, West Texas, like that, and there's this desert, they're probably gonna want a 30% annualized rate of return because it's a higher default rate, right? So less people out there using it, and then one day they just decide they're gonna stop paying on the land, because middle of nowhere, never used it. But as opposed to someone who's building a dirt bike track and putting a barn and minion on their 10 acres near Midland, Texas, right outside of the city, uh, they'll never default on that loan. If they do, then I'm taking back their barn and minion and dirt bike track and sprinkler system, etc. By the way, I don't know if Ken is online here. You're kind of crazy for not, he hasn't paid me off. I see he still owes like, 80,000 or something on the land, and it's like I have a first lien position. So, technically, if that guy ever stops paying or is late or whatever, I can accelerate him and foreclose him, which I would never do. But you know, I don't recommend building a hundred thousand dollar facility on a piece of land with a lien on it. But so, this is this was what really got me started. Actually, I had a subdivision out in Hudspeth County. Uh, it was 530 acres of land that I bought for $78 an acre. Some dude was going uh, through foreclosure, paid $40,000 for 534 acres, broke it up into all these 10 acre tracks, all plant exempt, Smith County's the Wild West, and one guy came in and paid me 4,500 a month for 60 months for 450 acres. So that was just obviously insane on a $40,000 investment and then my now a good friend and business uh, partner Mike uh, this was the first note he bought from me he gave me I collected like 30 uh, it was like maybe 19 or 20 or 30 payments on the land and then he came in and bought the note I gave him like a 28 percent annual return he gave me 118,000 cash and so just that one uh, 450 out of the 530 I like quadrupled my money and made like a hundred and 40,000 in like a year for two years, which is crazy. Uh, those deals are still out there today. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of this stuff for sale on the MLS. You guys just gotta get in the habit. I usually go on every Tuesday, landsofamerica.com or Zillow. And I just go county by county. I look all over Texas, whether it's Polk County in the Southeast or Lubbock County in the West. Just county by county, I'm just scrolling through the Lands of America list that's exactly how I found that Polk County one. I was just scrolling through the list and I was like, man, uh, you know, this one looks pretty cheap at 10,000 per acre for only seven acres. I already knew stuff was going for this much. So literally exactly what I do, I scroll through here. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on the MLS. I know a lot of you guys for real estate are SMS, texting, direct mailing. We'll probably send out only 2,500 or 3,000 mail units this year. Because most of my stuff has been on the MLS. Like we're doing one in Andrews County right now where it's, she wanted a million and 45,000 and I'm under contract for 
345 acres for 510,000. So it's literally less than half of uh, what she was asking. So that setup is, is still out there on the MLS. As more people go to AI and SMS texting, I'm just going more towards uh, the MLS. Cause I don't know, tried but true. So get out of here, we don't need this right now. All right, well, what questions do we have on this stuff? So where do you go to find the deed restrictions? Deed restrictions? Yeah. When, when do I find them? No, you know, where do you go like, like, to find those that are on the land? Where do you go to Well, there's really two facets to the deed. The question was about deed restrictions. I'd say there's really two facets to that. One is with the county it's probably going to make you do to subdivide it, um, whether you do a water feasibility test or have to do a flood survey or whatever. The second component is if someone in the title chain has put deed restrictions on the property, which you can do in Texas. Um, on my subdivides, I put usually put no commercial shooting ranges and no junkyards. I don't restrict livestock usually or housing or anything like that, but I don't want people shooting bullets all over the place or having junky lots. Yeah, Texas file. Texas file and see what has been recorded in the deeds before. See if anyone has recorded deed restrictions. And then once you get under contract, um, when you get the title report from the title company, you're gonna wanna ask them for the exception documents. All They'll have all the deeds and all the easements and right aways and stuff in the history of that particular piece of land. And you're gonna wanna look, go through every single one, especially on the big projects. And do a pretty good scan of them, make sure there's no restrictions, no crazy thousand foot wide easement that some power company negotiated for a hundred bucks a year, you know? Because some of that stuff is out there, it's rare. Um, but most of the stuff is not restricted, especially outside of city limits. So usually don't have to worry, but still check. Good question, what else? Similar question, and I, being this far out, I doubt you actually have to deal with it, but have you ever run into like zoning issues? No, not outside of city limits. I've never run into zoning. There's, um, that's, there can be some stuff written in the deeds which you need to be careful, like no mobile homes, no RVs, etc. cetera. Um, the best thing you can do if you're concerned about uh, zoning issues, just call the county. That's either, it's probably gonna, I mean, some have planning and zoning, like especially the bigger counties, but some like Wild West counties, like Hudspeth or whatever, um, you're gonna have to probably call multiple county offices. I would call the appraisal, um, clerks, commissioner's court and just ask them about any county-wide or if it's in the ETJ or the city, then yes, you'll have to deal with restrictions. You'll be talking to the city. But if you're in the county, I would say 99% no, but if you're concerned, just call the county and, and ask. They're probably just gonna laugh at you though and be like, no, there's no restrictions out here. Um, it's kind of just how it works a lot of these places. As long as you're not dumping sludge on the ground. What else? Yes, ma'am. Oil. Where's that? Who's telling you that? Interesting. So the question is, um, oil and gas, there's probably a lease road on the property. I deal with a lot of oil and gas, oil wells and pipelines uh, on my property. As a high level, a great resource is the Railroad Commission. Just Google Railroad Commission GIS map. You pull up all the pipelines, oil wells, all that stuff as you're um, looking at a project. Now you're already obviously under contract. Uh, is the oil is the oil well right at the public access way, and you need to get through it to get to the back? So it's in between, and then I want to, the other three is going to be in the back. So I'm trying to make it a road to access the back of it because I don't want to sell off this acre and the other yeah. things. But so I mean that was my intent, that's my 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 intent. So the idea that I don't want to sell off the others or do something with it. I'm really
really surprised that Wise County is requesting anything special with oil and gas because as a surface owner, um, the oil and gas company, for instance, on their uh, road, that's a right away that you have 100% ownership of as a surface owner. The oil company is being granted right to use that surface. Yeah. Yes. Definitely we're get. We're all in agreement on doing that, and we already approved. So I took it into them, and they said, "No, of course we're into the commissioner. I won't be." So I have to get to be called the commissioner's board. But uh, I'm just wondering if you had ever encountered anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I've done many subdivides with um, oil and gas and pipelines and lease roads and all that stuff. Um, and I think this is a question for a real estate attorney because I don't think that Wise County, again, I'm not an attorney, but from my experience, I don't think Wise County can request you to get a variance or anything like that because the oil company on the lease roads and stuff on your surface, they don't own, that's not their surface. They're, that's their access. And you pull their right away agreement, but I can almost guarantee in there, it says that you have 100% right for ingress, egress, um, and enjoyment of the land. You just can't build anything permanent on it, which is understandable. But I would definitely be getting an attorney involved in this because I think Wise County is probably jacking you around. I think so. And that doesn't sound right. It's been a year. Yeah, yeah, that's too long. Um, how how uh, big is the project? Like, oh, it's how much? Just, it's just eight. But dollars wise, acres. how much are we talking? I don't know yet because it was my. I wasn't first off the first lease. I still remember the house, and I wanted it to somebody that sold it. Yeah, it's at least one hundred and fifty thousand, probably a couple hundred thousand at least and land, I would think, Wise County like that. So it's worth having, you know, a 500 or $1,000 discussion with an attorney and have them probably send a demand letter to the commissioner's court and be like, hey, uh, we've examined the easement and the right away from the oil company. This is our surface. They have the right to use it, but you don't have a right to kind of jack us around like this. Um, so yeah, I don't think, I think, I don't think that's the, I think, there, I think there's something else going on. I think that's probably a little bit of politics in action. So Thank that's you. a good question. Yeah, look at the attorney on that. What else? If the land comes to the highway, then uh, you go, where are you going to find the lease permissions like the future development? Like, how was the road going to expand? The TOT or? Yeah, that's a textile question. Um, it's, they're not really going to have anything on how much. The question was, how are you going to find if it's like an expanding road or something? Tech stop, you do want to look into a tech stop, it's a tech stop road, they can limit the spacing entries, which is it's a great question that you brought up. They can say you need uh, 300 or 500 or whatever, depending on the speed limit, uh, foot spacing between each driveway, which can affect your subdivide architecture and how you're breaking up uh, the lots. So if it touches the highway, you'll for sure want to give tech stop a call. Yep, county and FM road, that's a question for the county. Um, they're a lot looser with restrictions. They usually don't really have any spacing requirements. A lot of them will want you to do like a commercial entryway though, which we did a couple of those in Midland County, 25 grand each. That can be expensive. They want you to put concrete and culvert and all that entryway into your subdivision. All right, any other questions? If you got some that pop up, there's my email, there's my website, Instagram, hit me up. I answer it all. Appreciate you guys.